welcome to the House of Lords podcast. In this episode, Matt speaks to the two speakers about their roles. Welcome back to a brand new season of the House of Lords podcast. In our first episode of the series, Matt speaks to not one, but two speakers, our very own Lord Speaker, Lord McFall of Alcoyth, and Speaker of the House of Commons, Sir Lindsay Hoyle. In their conversation, they discuss their similar backgrounds on the way to becoming Speaker and forging a new working relationship and how things have changed over the last two years. Here's what they had to say. Hello, I'm John McFall. I'm Lord McFall of Alcluth, the Speaker of the House of Lords. I'm Lindsay. I'm the Speaker of the House of Commons, coming up to this prestigious building. And you're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Speaker, Mr Speaker, for joining us on the podcast this month. Delighted to be asking the questions to not one, but two speakers. Uh, so can I start with a bit of history? You both sat in the Commons uh, between 97 and 2010. Did you work much together then? And did, you, did that sort of relationship you built up there mean that you worked together well as speakers? Lord Macfall was too grand then. I was just a <laughs> lowly Labour backbencher. <laughs> no, no, in fairness, um, he was held in high esteem amongst colleagues right across the House of Commons. So it's not just from our background of both being in the Labour Party. I actually was on DTI Select Committee with uh, Martin O'Neill, who's tragically no longer with us. So we used to look across to this chair of the Treasury Select Committee. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, but I, I was on DTI. I always knew about John. Well respected, well renowned. And I've got to say, it's not often you can say that he was a politician everybody spoke very highly of. So Yes, I did know him, but not that closely. That friendship grew later. And uh, I occupied a seat behind Lindsay, but two benches behind him at the end. So I looked down in Lindsay every time I went Still into does. the house. <laughs> 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 but what I remember about Lindsay is he, he sat just near the edge of the gangway and he was bobbing up and down all the time, asking the questions uh, every time almost on behalf of his constituency and on behalf of his areas. And we share a common heritage and we're both local lads uh, from the area that, that we represented. And that was a really important element of our representative history because it's a dual function you have. I said to people that the work I do in the constituency informs how I ask questions and how I approach my work in Westminster. And Lindsay was the very same. So we echoed the local element to it. We realised that we were representatives having to undertake work, particularly when we were in government, on these issues. But we never forgot the local element of it. And uh, Lindsay was high up in that all the time. Of course, John's absolutely correct. We're local guys. Local community knows us, born and brought up there. Because I always say to MPs, you know, we're the lucky ones. Because if somebody mentions a street, a road, somewhere in the constituency, not only will I know the road, I probably know somebody on it. And it's exactly the same for both of us. The leader of the council said to me, when I got a first elected, Tony Blair, a huge landslide, came in, he said to me, Lindsay, enjoy. If you're lucky, you might get two terms. <laughs> so I've got to tell you, that stuck with me, and I've never, ever... Taking it, I take it so seriously. I'm still knocking on all the doors. I still do all the things. And it's important to me because in the end, when somebody says to me, you're always on about that hospital. Yeah, I was born in that hospital. That's why it matters to me. You know, that supermarket matters. That market matters because that's where I shop, just like John. It's our local community. We're embedded in that community. I was the mayor of the town. I was on the council. I did 18 years on the council before I came to Parliament. And I've always represented the village I live in since 1980. <laughs> which is, you know, mm. so we've got great affinity and that's what we have got so much in common on that. Yeah. And that helps with working together as speakers? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I could tell one 
tale myself from local. There's a small village in my constituency known as Renton, very small. Uh, they actually have a football team that won the Scottish Cup in 1880-odd. You know, so the, the history goes away back. It's forgotten now. But I went to the local school, Renton Primary, and uh, I knew the teacher, and she introduced me to the, the class. And she said, and who is our special guest today? Yeah, does anyone know? And this hand shot up to the front, you know, with alacrity. Whoop! Yes, miss, I know who it is. That's John McFall. He's the Prime Minister of Renton. <laughs> <laughs> That, that just sums up that affinity, isn't it? And, and, and I think that's what's so good yeah. about it, is that John's so, so well-known, I'm the same, that people can stop and talk to us. And I think that's what really matters. They know who we are. You go with... People come up from Westminster, they'll come with me. They said, everybody knows you, everybody speaks to you. Yeah, because I've always lived there. Mm -hmm. But it's the same for both of us. It's that close affinity. John, very close to the church, like myself, that, you know, I have friends all over... You know, whether it's the farmers, whether it's the church, the schools, everybody knows us because we work on behalf of everybody. And I think that's what has always mattered to both of us. I'm just going to say this. Not only was he a famous teacher, I go to this company in Blackburn, major company, and this guy says to me, do you know uh, John Mike Fall? I said, just like, well, he used to teach me, you know. <laughs> And he knew them. He knew both the brothers. Yes, I know, I know. I said, you were talking to Rosemary Curry's son? Exactly. So we knew it. <laughs> so that was instant response. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and that just shows, you, doesn't it? Not only they don't live there, and they even come down to Lancashire, they still talk about the MP that they had. Uh, obviously, this is a House of Lords podcast, but nonetheless, it'd be remiss, Mr Speaker, if I didn't give you an opportunity to tell us about life in the Commons at the moment. And particularly as well, with Lord Matfall's kindly shared with us before what he does as Lord Speaker. So could you tell us a little bit about your role in, as Speaker of the Commons, please? <laughs> yes, I'm still trying to get used to the idea of what, what, what is a Speaker in the Commons really like? Because we've not really found out what it's like. No sooner than I, I got elected, within days I'm into a general election, then Christmas comes, everybody's talking about Brexit, before we know it, we're then into a pandemic. Mm. So looking back, I'm on an education programme just like the MPs that came in in 2019, you know, I'm try trying to establish what is the Commons like. Um, and we're getting somewhere near how it should be. Mm. So I've got to say, going through that very dark period, and it was a very dark period, the pandemic came, there was nobody in the buildings. I was virtually here on my own. There was about 50 people around. And just just like what Matt thought, it was about keeping the house open, keeping it operational. And that was the major challenge. And as people will know, they will tell you what for the last 750 years and 158 speakers have done in the past. Nobody had done, as the 158 speaker, anything like we're doing now. Because, of course, it takes centuries to change something normally, mm. but we had to change yeah. it within 24 hours. And what it did show me about, about these great, this great palace and these great houses, how the staff adapted how the staff made a real difference, how they changed the way we work overnight. And they said, people say it's not possible. They made it possible. And they made my job so much easier. One, we've got so many staff who come into this building. It's about the security staff, but it was about getting people through this pandemic. It's about people being at home, doing the right thing by them, making sure that they were kept in touch with as well, because we've got MPs. It's not just about MPs. And as Speaker... I have a role and a duty of care to the staff of the House of Commons. I have a duty of care to the staff that work for the MPs as well. And about all those people who make this place tick, the police and the people that come in to support us. So it's about working with them in very difficult times and times that nobody could foresee. And getting through that made a real difference for me as Speaker. So now what I'm going to say is I've been through all that. And hopefully I will now begin to establish what the role of the speaker should be in normal times. But at the end of that, the speaker's bit is the easy bit in the chamber in a sense. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's difficult, but, but actually that's a, such a small part of being speaker. It, it's, you know, when we, when we start at 8.30 in the morning and I'm still here at 10 and three hours may have been done in the chamber or whatever, two hours, whatever that is, the rest of the time is booked up with other things. Mm. So it's about the speaker's role that's much greater. Well, actually, if you bear down on it, there's a real similarity 
between what Lindsay does and I do. For example, uh, I'm responsible for the business in the House when sitting, so I'm on the rules act, just as Lindsay's on the Speaker's chair. Uh, I also chair the Commission, and that is a real heavy responsibility, uh, and we'll, I'll come back to that element, but it's very similar there. And also, I've got an ambassadorial role like Lindsay. For example, just in the past few weeks, I've met the EU ambassador, the Japanese ambassador. I'm going to the South Korean embassy uh, this week. I met the Spanish ambassador and I met the, the German one. And therefore, Lindsay and I have got that responsibility of representing the House to the outside world. And that is very important. And we must ensure that it's a welcoming place. It is, and it's about both using soft power to make friends around the world, you know, reaching out. Democracy matters to both of us. It's, a, it's about meeting up with people, sharing ideals, and a, and, and, and a nice, soft approach to visiting ambassadors to make sure their country feel that they've got somebody to speak to, whether that's in the Commons or the Lords. They've got that. But it's also about this, I believe, is a unique working relationship between the Lords and the Commons at the moment. I think it's so, so important to both of us. And the way that Lord McFall, myself, and the two clerks we meet, we sit down, we discuss. How can we help each other? What does the future mean for both of us? You know, what can we do together? And, and, and it is those issues that we're able to discuss. You know, there is no imaginary brick wall between these two buildings. It's about being able to go between the two buildings. One time they said to me, oh, the Speaker can't the Lords. The Lords have to come to the Speaker of the Commons. He's the senior person. Why? My legs are able to walk down here. I'd sooner enjoy a nice cup of tea with my good friend, even if there's not a biscuit on offer. I'm still more than happy to come and see. But that's what it's about. And it's about that difference, isn't it? It's about building a real working relationship, a relationship that benefits everybody. And that's what we both want to do. And hopefully that's beginning to, to be seen and to be shown. And why aren't we working closer together on certain areas as well? You know, why don't we have a joint committee that begins to share some of the roles, that saves money. We're not talking about taking power away from either house, far from it. But, you know, there's savings to be had by working together. Let's discuss it. You know, there are things that we can do and that we can make happen where I don't believe it was possible in the past. And Lindsay and I are mindful of the duty of care concept. Now, the staff matter to us as well. This is to be a, a place that they're welcome and their initiative and their experience and their skills are appreciated on that. And that cultural element is really important for us. And the criteria for today, I think, with Lindsay coming along to me, was age. And so, therefore, this, that's why... She's trying to say I'm the House of Lords at the, at the moment <laughs> on that. But, but, but that duty of care and reaching out is important. And uh, during the next three weeks, I'll be visiting Northern Ireland uh, soon, and I'll be going to the Scottish Parliament as well. And Lindsay and I are very much aware that there is a country beyond Watford. It's really important, and we've got to engage uh, with the whole country. Well, the world starts beyond Watford. Yeah. <laughs> as, <laughs> as we all know. As, as I understand. <laughs> yeah, we're on our way, Dave, isn't here? And just today, it's interesting. The Isle of Man, the Chief Minister's been in. You know, we've got to have that relationship. You know, here we are, Crown Dependencies. Mm. You know, these are Crown Territories, and it's so, so important that they also feel, because it is their problem where we make decisions, impacts on them, mm. just in the same way of overseas territories. They are part of both houses. It might surprise people listening to the podcast of, you know, the, the different dimensions to both of your roles. You mentioned the ambassadorial part of it, the visits, chairing commissions and stuff like that. And obviously we're sat here, annunciate, annunciators going, is that a division in the Lords? Um, as, we, as we're sat here. But the question I suppose to ask is what's the most difficult thing about your roles? Is it the busyness of it or? Making friends and losing friends depending on who you take for questions. <laughs> That's always the difficult. I've, I've got to say, it's amazing, isn't it? Everybody's smiling at you to try and so that you'll call them next. The moment that somebody doesn't, it's amazing how no longer it's a smile at you, it's almost hate that comes out of them. So, yeah, it, it, look, look, the one thing we must remember, we're all volunteers. Nobody's made us become an MP, and certainly nobody, nobody made us become the Speaker. We put ourselves forward. So I always think not only is it a privilege to represent the people of Charlie, just in the same way as Lord Mike Fault, born and brought up there to represent and to become an MP for Charlie, 
to me, was everything. And the icing on the cake was to become speaker. Nobody made me do it. I volunteer for it. And I've got to say, it's not smooth all the time. But in the end, it's a damn good job. It's good to be an MP. And as I say, the icing on the cake was to become speaker. I have no complaints. I get the best out of it. I try to put everything into it. And I try to take the best out of it. Because I really do enjoy it. You know, it's an absolute privilege. Never before have they had a Lancashire accent in the speakership. In 158 years, they've forgotten about the Red Rose County. Well, I'm here to remind them Lancashire is live and well, and we're beginning to run London. And I'm the first Scot uh, to be the Lord Speaker. And when I came down here all those years ago, I think I was speaking rather fast in my own dialect. So I said, the only concession I will make to people down here is that I will speak slower so that they can understand the intelligent contribution I am making. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Opportunity <laughs> here. That's the showstopper. Exactly. Mr. Speaker, that is the how, showstopper. How do you follow that? How do you follow that? Um, opportunity here before I come on to rivalry and into house rivalry. Um, is there anything particularly you admire about how the other house works? If we maybe start, Lord Speaker? Actually, you know, Prime Minister's questions is roundly condemned on a lot of occasions with the media. But I liked Prime Minister's questions. You've got to, first of all, realise it's theatre, right? You've got to realise where members are coming from. But there's the important thing about Prime Minister's questions, whether you're a government minister on the opposition front bench or a member, is there's a message you want to get out. So amidst, amid the bluster, amid the humour or whatever else, you have got to get that message out. And if you're putting a question to the Prime Minister, I went with the rule that if you go over 40 seconds, people start getting bored and they'll heckle and they'll shout Mr. Uh, Speaker's at, nodding. At you exactly <laughs> on that. So get your message over in 40 seconds. That's the issue. And I'm sure Lindsay, in that experienced position as Mr. Speaker, would endorse that completely. I suddenly get a cough. <laughs> <laughs> My pen taps very heavily on the side of the chair arm. So, yeah, you know, uh, absolutely frustration if people start taking long, too long. Because what it means is somebody else isn't going to get in, and that's totally unfair. You know, selfishness is something that we shouldn't have to prescribe to. I'm thinking about before you both became deputy speakers and obviously now speakers, how much as backbench MP, or in your case, Lord Matt Fall was a backbench peer, did you work with other members of the House to get things done for your constituencies or to change legislation? That's the, largely the unseen element, remember. So I mentioned about Leighton, uh, Prime Minister's questions, but the drawback about that is that people will think that you're at each other's throats all the time. It's nothing like that. I'll give you an example. Myself as chairman of the Treasury Committee, uh, I took over in 21 to the 2010 election. And uh, Lindsay will uh, uh, inform you as well that that was a very sensitive political committee, the Economic Committee, because it's, if you like, one of the most uh, important and politically divisive. But my task was to say to the fellow members from across the, the spectrum, look, if we're going to have any purchase in public and indeed in the floor of the House, then the reports we make have got to be unanimous. In other words, they've got to be factual, because if they're not unanimous, it's just seen as one side saying something and one side uh, saying another thing. And I'm proud of the fact that the Treasury Committee, uh, under my chairmanship, uh, had a 100% record in the unanimity and what I did is mirrored elsewhere in the Commons as well, particularly. And it's that uh, collective will to ensure that we get a policy right and we hold the government to account in that role. And that's a really big element to it. So any time we talk about Prime Minister's questions, I really have to balance it with the cooperation we find uh, across the chamber as, as well on that. I chaired on the, the rule site last Friday, a bill on work and the definition of work, whether employed, one is employed or whether one is uh, taken on as on a consultant basis. It was introduced by a Labour peer, but it was followed by a Conservative peer 
who agreed completely with the proposal that was put forward, a crossbencher then came in as a result of that. And having that unanimity of purpose, it really helps influence public policy as well. So a key important element is that working across the aisle, as the Americans would say, and ensuring we get that unanimity. And I think Lindsay would agree on that. Absolutely. And I think, I think the issue is that you know, when you're a backbench MP, a campaign, I was speaking up for Chorley, you know, you run campaigns, whether it was free TV licences or free bus passes, which started that off in Chorley, brought it through, it took ages for, for the government to actually pick up on it, and they did, as you thankfully to people like Lord Macfall, started to find where the money was that we can pay for these things when we we're there. And it was about starting with that, you know, and even being on the select committee, opposing the government on the privatisation of Royal Mail. When I was there, I wouldn't dream of doing it. Uh, only comes after I've left that role in DTI. So, you know, there were great big issues, great big campaigns that you could run as a backbench and being part of it. You know, the fight to make sure that Gibraltar had the right of self-determination that was going to be taken off them. You know, and I ran that campaign very heavily. Although, you know, I, I made friends, but I certainly made a lot of enemies. You know, the fact um, that it didn't quite fit in. You know, sometimes you've got to say, well, if the government's not quite right, you've got to have to stand up by the conviction of your beliefs, which I did. So was, I wasn't a natural rebel, but if I needed to be, I could put my view across and maybe that couldn't be quite forced through the lobby if I didn't think it was right. Because in the end, I always say to people, it's not the whips that elect me, it's the good people of Chorley. I've got to go and face them on a Saturday. I might face the whips that night, but when I go back to my constituency, I've got to be able to hold my head high. And that's what I've always tried to be able to say to me, ah, but you can no longer represent us now. You're the Speaker of the Commons. Well, I forget this, I still go back to Chorley every weekend because just like Bob Macball, our home is back where we were born and brought up. And the difference is, it's a different way of doing it. I'm not stood up every day, bobbing up and down, trying to catch the eye of the speaker. The difference now is, it's a different type of access. Mm -hmm. So the access is that they closed the a &E at Chorley, it was never going to reopen. Guess what? It's reopened. Why? Because they have access to ministers, secretaries, days, the prime minister. They come into my office, they come to see me. So it's a different way of using power without abusing it in order to still benefit the constituents that elected me, because they do still come first. I think we've established there's a good nature rivalry, certainly between you both, but um, between the houses, perhaps instead I could explore, Mr Speaker, you mentioned the election versus the appointment, and perhaps we can explore there about the sort of constitutional tension there and why it's important perhaps to have houses appointed on different bases for the supremacy of the Commons. Do, do either of you want to take that up? As a member of the House of Lords and now as Lord Speaker, I've always been conscious of the supremacy of, of the House of Commons. The way I, I describe it is, and Lindsay will come back in <laughs> against me, but the House of Commons does insufficient scrutiny. So what do we do? It, when the legislation comes along, it has the equivalent of a dirty face. And we scrub it up, and we make it nice and clean, and we get the cheeks rosy and send it back to the House of Commons. And do you know what happens sometimes with recalcitrant young people or whatever else it is, they don't listen. So they throw it out for us. So we get it back again and we say, well, look, wait a minute, you know, this has been really naughty. We're really going to scrub it up for you this time and send it back to you, which we'll do. And if they're really persistent on it, well, it's up to you. We've given you our best advice. You go forward because they are sovereign. That's very important. So what are we doing in the House of Lords? We are assisting the process of democracy. Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, th I think there's good facts in there, some, some interesting points. What, what I would say is, look, in the end, do I have people coming to my constituents saying, it's time to get rid of the Lords? It doesn't happen. People actually don't complain. And people are knocking at my door to say, we've got to get rid of them. So... There is no stampede of people wanting to change what we've got. What we've got does work. I acknowledge that completely. And you are right. It's about having time. I think sometimes government feel pressure to put a bill through so quickly they don't think the consequence or were the pitfalls of the bill. So it does need people to go through it. It does need people who've got time on their hands because they've nothing else to do. So therefore they can begin to look at where 
the problems are or where it's not quite joined up. So, of course, there's a good role, you know, and, and, and that does matter. Scrutiny does matter. And having another set of eyes looking at it, refining and suggesting, I think is great. You know, it would have to be done somewhere. So what we've got works and it's sent back. And I've got to say, wherever the political balance is, in fairness to the Lords, they do come up with good ideas and do go against their own party as well. You know, the, the, there is this belief there is more independence to peers because the whipping system is much harder to whip a peer than what it is a member of parliament. Because ambition is not driven when you've got to a certain age, you're not quite driven as the young members in the Commons are. So, you know, there's, there's this elder statesman and people who come from the Commons or industry or wherever are looking and scrutinising and they send it back. And if they have got it wrong, of course we'll ignore them. But of course, if we think they've got a point, we will look at it and the House will take it on board. Of course, we don't trust them with money. That will be too much. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in fairness, I think there is a role and there is a need for a second scrutiny and also that fresh pair of eyes that's independent. And while there's no clamour to get rid of them, of course, I'm always pleased to see my good friend, the Lord speak. Good. For a period of time during Labour government, I was in the Whip's office, you know, under the leadership of really good Chief Whips, for example, Nick Brown, uh, Hilary Armstrong... When a bill comes forward, like say at the time, you remember the education bill uh, where we had endless issues with the House of Lords, you would get somebody uh, next looking at this bill to begin with and saying, wait a minute, uh, we're going to have problems with some backbenchers here in the House of Commons uh, that are putting amendments, for example, uh, Hoyle and his mates will object to A, B, C, D or E, so we better watch that. But then when it goes to the House of Lords, wait a minute, the House of Lords will probably kick this out as a result of, of that. So watch that. And therefore, we had to take into consideration the interests of the House of Lords as well, because at the end of the day, it shaped the, the legislation itself. Let me give you a more current example. When I entered the House of Lords, I was asked to go on the future of the Parliamentary Commission for Banking Standards. It was chaired by Andrew Tyree, my successor in the Treasury Committee, but it was an independent body. Uh, David Cameron, at the time Prime Minister, established that. The Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Nigel Lawson, Andrew Turnbull, the, the former head of the civil service, and myself were on it from the House of Lords. We had members from the House of Commons as well, and it worked really, really well. Now, when we produced a report after a couple of years, there were aspects that the government didn't want to implement, to accept. And Andrew Tyree uh, wrote to myself and others and said, look, the government don't want that. It's up to yourselves where you can have time to scrutinise this work. There is no guillotine on, on you, so therefore it's not a limited time. Uh, look at that for us to see if we can get the change. And indeed, the combined efforts of Nigel Lawson, Archbishop Scantby, uh, Andrew Tumble, myself, we got those changes. So that was of value in the House of Lords to the work of the House of Commons as well uh, on that. And that's the positive engagement. And Lindsay and I want to work in that aspect even more uh, on that. It's really, really important bringing both houses together. And there's plenty of ideas that we've got uh, to do that. For example, when I did the review of committees in the House of Lords, it was suggested that there could be short-term appointments to the House of Commons select committees. It was Frank Field who chaired the Welfare Committee at the time said we could do that. Sarah Willison, who chaired the Lesson Committee, said, look, why don't our respective Lays and Committees meet once a year so as a result? So there's opportunities for us to do things. And Lindsay and I are in the tent in showing that leadership so that we can get that change uh, and ensuring that the legislation becomes more appropriate uh, for good law. You've both presided over historic changes to the way Parliament's operated, um, virtual and hybrid meetings, virtual voting. So how does it feel to be back to normal? And has the experience of the last sort of 18 months or so changed your opinions on how Parliament should operate in the future? It's a very good question. I think the one thing is that we did have maternity and paternity leave, and therefore there was proxy votes for that. 
I do believe there is a case for the extension of people with critical illness, very serious illness. But actually, we should also allow for somebody to vote for them as well. I think that is so important because their constituents deserve that somebody is actually voting on their behalf. So that's you know something I think we could look to extend. The other thing is that what has proved really successful for us is card readers. You know, the fact you can go up with your pass, you touch a screen, you vote it. The fact that you had to come past one teller to give your name for it to be, you know, somebody to put a line through your name, it's a bit antiquated and very, very slow. And the fact is that we had to wait from clerks who weren't expecting vote, junior clerks were rushing downstairs, trying to get a lift, old members are waiting, trying to get out because they want to get away. Um, well, why don't we just have pass readers? Which we did, we brought them in, we've got four, we can have eight pass readers, as many as we wish, in each lobby, so people can vote, it's just quickly, we can get through votes like that, and that's the difference. The idea that you've got to wait 12 minutes to try and get a vote through, no, you can do it in six, seven minutes very easily with pass readers. So if somebody's got to stay, we've kept the pass readers, it's so, so important. And select committees, you know, is it wrong that select committees could meet on teams because that's the way that you may be taking evidence, it's another way forward? And, you know, if somebody who should have been given evidence and suffers an illness or something, you could still do it on teams. You know, so you can take evidence that way. I think, I think there's some good things that we can look back on. Obviously, I don't understand all the people's toes because it is for others to look into this. But I definitely would say now, straight away, the fact that you can use your past to vote why didn't we do it sooner? That's the big question. Yeah, I think the past year uh, has shown the quality of personnel we have in the Parliament in terms of staff. Who would have thought that almost instantly we had to go uh, from a system of physical presence to one of remote that we could do legislation remotely. That was a fantastic achievement in a year. And I think the record shows that the UK Parliament is amongst the top in the world for that change. Uh, so we have to recognise the good work there and certainly the, the work that the staff undertook. We've also got a group now, those with long-term illness uh, and disabled, we've got the opportunity for some of them to participate virtually. And I've just come off the Woolsack today after oral questions, and there were three people that I called virtually as a result of that. Most people in the chamber, but the opportunity for these people virtually. Who would have thought that we could have done that a year or so ago? So that's in advance. The committee work that we've done, the feedback I've had from that is that the remote working for committees worked extremely well, and they want to keep that as an option. Some committee members here, but others been remote and uh, participating remotely. And what the committee structure has achieved is the opportunity for us to have a global footprint. You know, if we want evidence from somebody in America or uh, somebody in Africa or whatever, we can do that virtually. So we've adapted our approach and our technology for that. And like the House of Commons, we have got the peer hub here as well which we're still using for members. And it's a more efficient uh, initiative that we've got, and that's very helpful. And I think the lasting thing for me is that, it, particularly the House, the House of Lords with a more elderly uh, population, you would think that we would have been slower rather than faster in adapting to change. But no, we've been like Willy Winky, you know, get in there and keep everybody awake on it. So keep in mind the technological progress that we have made and the changes that will be made in society. I keep thinking of 2007, which to me was just around the corner. But in 2007, that was the year of the iPhone. And that's a new life that's been adopted since 2007. So the pace of change technologically is going to be great, and we have got to be alive to that, because our primary interest is engaging with the public and with society. That's our primary interest. A colleague and I in the library earlier were discussing the counterfactual of how Parliament would have responded sort of 15 years ago without virtual technology, but perhaps that's for another day. Um, <laughs> speaking of history, early this year, you both marked the 80th anniversary of the House of Lords lending its chamber uh, to MPs after the House of Commons chamber was destroyed in the Second World War. Does that kind of history sort of ever weigh on your shoulders in the roles you carry well, on? Who knows? You may want to repeat it. 
<laughs> something was to go wrong, you know. It might be that you're going to a grand building somewhere else and you might say to Thomas Luke, if you've got a chamber, we've got one spare for you. <laughs> what, what I would say, <laughs> but, it, but it shows the working relationship even there. Absolutely. That people recognise Luke. Let's do the right thing. People have elected members of parliament. They need to sit. And in fairness to the laws, they were very... We were, we were very grateful as members all those years ago to be able to walk in to this spectacular chamber and to be able to use that. You know, the fight that Artley, Churchill had used that chamber without even being a peer is, is something unique, isn't it? It's wonderful history that was there. But in the end, it shows that we value democracy, both in this side of the House and our side of the house, was the coming together to support the fact that the Commons had lost the chamber, the Lords were willing to give theirs up in order for the Prime Minister to be able to address the House of Commons. I think, you know, it's unique, and I'm sure that would still be the same today, and that's what's so important, is that ability to be able to work together, to share things together for the best, and the best we can give this country in representation. Yeah, absolutely. And Lindsay and I had a great day on that day celebrating it as a result. And I think I could say that the House of Lords is engaging, generous and modest. And why do I say modest? Because Churchill's greatest speeches will fight them on the beaches or whatever. They were made from the red benches, Lindsay, uh, on I that. thought they were the BBC and studio. Nobody I'm knew that. Intimate. Very few knew that because Churchill and the cabinet didn't want the Germans to know that. that it had a detrimental effect in Parliament. So there you are. Lindsay, you're welcome any time. Brilliant. <laughs> we'll be in next week. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to, to just finish off, um, a personal note of modesty, apart from this podcast... Favourite moments from your speakership so far? It's this <laughs> the, podcast, isn't it? I, 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 look, <laughs> you know, there's so many, but of course, it's been here today with Lord Macfall. It's the friendship that we build. I'm, I'll be quite honest. It's a great working relationship. And that's just one of the achievements I think we've managed to achieve together. Absolutely. And for me, on my first day, uh, welcoming the Queen to Parliament, that was a real privilege uh, for myself. And today, I was up Elizabeth Tower and saw Big Ben uh, working and if anything it's a shared ownership it's Big Ben and Lindsay and I look forward to the iconic chimes next year ringing out and we will celebrate yeah. together. Couldn't be better <laughs> Lord Speaker, Mr Speaker thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. That's a real pleasure, thank you and Lindsay thanks for your visit today Lord Macfall, <laughs> I wouldn't dare not come <laughs> <laughs> And that's it for this episode of the House of Lords podcast. We'll be back in a few weeks with a special episode for the start of Black History Month. Until then, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts.